15-year-old Nicole van der Herck's murder caused quite a stir in her hometown of Eindhoven, Netherlands. Although an intensive search began to find her killer, there was not enough physical evidence to pinpoint a suspect. 16 years later, though, a Facebook comment would lead investigators closer to the truth and unveil a twisted plot that would ultimately unmask a killer. Hello, and welcome back to Mysterious 7. Today we'll look at a case with the most insane twists you've ever heard. This is the case of Nicole Vandenherk. But before we get into it, please remember to subscribe and like our channel. Also, don't forget to click on the notification bell to get the latest content directly to your inbox. Now, let's dive into another mystery. Eindhoven is located toward the south of the Netherlands. It's a city bustling with innovation and is known to be a hub for technology and design. It's the birthplace of electronics giant Philips and is dubbed the City of Lights because of the annual Glow Eindhoven Festival in which light artists showcase their light installations throughout the city. Eindhoven offers visitors an eclectic blend of modern monuments and ancient architecture that symbolize European living. It's in this city the twisting tale of our case begins. Born on July 4, 1980 in Erkelenz, Germany, Nicole was raised by her mother, Angelica Tegermeyer. Nicole was allegedly the product of an extramarital affair. A year after her birth, a paternity test proved that a married man from the same village was her biological father. Nicole never shared a relationship with her father, though. A few months later, Angelica met musician Ad van der Herk. Two years after meeting, they married and moved to Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Together, Angelica and Ad raised Nicole and his son Andy from another marriage. It was a well-blended family, but the marriage would not last long. Nicole's mother, Angelica, suffered from severe mental health issues. She often isolated herself from her family and suffered from bouts of depression. Angelica and Ad divorced in 1989 when Nicole was eight years old. Ad, however, filed for primary custody of Nicole, citing that Angelica would be unfit to raise their daughter. He was awarded full custody and raised both Andy and Nicole. However, being a musician meant Ad traveled frequently, and Nicole and Andy lived primarily with Ad's mother, their grandmother. Due to Angelica's mental health issues, she and Nicole did not share a mother-daughter relationship in the traditional sense. After a while, Nicole's dad met another woman, a fellow musician named Yolanda van der Weeden. She seemed to get along pretty well with the family, and soon Yolanda and Ad married. Both being musicians, Yolanda and Ad were often still on the road touring, leaving both Andy and Nicole to be raised by their grandmother in Eindhoven. Nicole was very close to her grandmother and did not mind this. Tragedy, though, followed Nicole. After Ad's remarriage, Angelica, who still loved him, fell into a depression despite the help she'd been receiving. In April 1995, Angelica committed suicide when Nicole was around 14 years old. Nicole was devastated by the news. She'd lost the chance to repair her relationship with her mother. However, her family and friends stepped in and did not allow Nicole to fall into a depressive spell that could see her spiraling dangerously out of control like her mother. Ad spent as much time comforting Nicole as he could. Her friends, too, stepped in and became the support group she needed. She eventually put her mind to focus and got herself a job at a nearby bakery in Wonstel. Keeping herself busy kept her mind away from intrusive thoughts. Her family and friends said she was overall a good person, trustworthy and very responsible. It was these personality traits that raised the alarm. On October 6, 1995, Nicole left her grandmother's house at around 5 a.m. and cycled to work. This was her everyday route, and she never missed a shift without good reason. So when Nicole failed to show up for work, her manager and the bakery owner called the police to report her missing. Police then contacted her grandmother and father, but they too hadn't seen Nicole and said she had left for work as per the usual. Police launched an immediate search, canvassing the area and asking people if they'd seen Nicole or her bike in the immediate vicinity. Scouring the surrounding area, it wasn't until later that same evening that Nicole's bicycle was found along the bank of the Dommel River. Sadly, there was no trace of Nicole or her belongings. 
Looking into Nicole's background, investigators started to believe that Nicole, like other teenagers sometimes do, simply ran away from home. She did suffer a great loss and still had extended family in Germany. Her father, Ad, however, said that it was highly unlikely as she'd not shown any signs of rebelling or wanting to leave. The search continued, and on October 19, 1995, her backpack was found near the Eindhoven Canal. Investigators continued to receive numerous tips, totaling nearly 300 leads. Then, things changed on October 24, 1995, when a man called the police station, claiming to know the identity of the person who killed Nicole. The call cut off abruptly before it could be traced, and left investigators with more questions than answers. This flipped the course of the investigation on end. Police now continuously interviewed Nicole's friends and family, poring over all the evidence they had in order to catch a break in the case. Nicole's stepmother, Yolanda, allegedly contacted psychics as the frustration of Nicole's disappearance weighed on everyone involved. They were told to concentrate on two canals. Using search and rescue police dogs, Investigators conducted a thorough walkthrough of the alleged areas Nicole may have possibly gone to, but there was just no trace of her. All this changed on November 22, 1995. A hiker who was passing by the woods between the towns of Mierlo and Lirop discovered human remains. He ran to the nearby town and informed local authorities of his discovery. The police arrived on the scene and already suspected who the remains belonged to. After forensic testing, the remains were identified as Nicole Vandenherk, ending the search in tragedy. An autopsy revealed that Nicole had suffered two fractures to the jaw and injuries to her head and fingers. She had also been raped and was stabbed by a small knife that broke her rib and ultimately caused her death due to internal bleeding. Her family was devastated even more so when they were told that there was no evidence to help identify her killer. Nicole's funeral was held on November 28, 1995, and was attended by over a thousand mourners who wanted to pay their last respects to the beautiful blonde teen. This was only the beginning of a long journey to justice. Her boyfriend at the time was interviewed, but being a minor, his name and photo had not been released, and he was cleared after no evidence could be found linking him to her murder. Police also tried another angle by broadcasting the phone call made by the anonymous man on national television in January 1996, hoping someone would recognize the voice and come forward. Unfortunately, though, this tactic did not bear any fruit. The case was getting cold fast until police discovered yet another lead. A friend of the Vandenherk family, Celine Hartogs, was arrested and detained in Miami in February 1996 for drug trafficking. During her questioning, she told police that the men she had been working for allegedly murdered Nicole. She further claimed that because of her knowledge of the crime, she was forced to be a drug mule in order to save her own life. Initially, Ad himself believed the girl and supported her claims, but over time, her stories became a bit more whimsical. Police questioned her further and were soon able to whittle away at the lies and discovered her story was flawed. She had just been trying to shave off prison time from her own sentence. Ad also distanced himself from the story and continued to search for answers in Nicole's death. Police pulled out all the stops and brought both Ad and Andy in for questioning between May and June 1996 regarding Nicole's murder. It was a small town, and people were shocked when police began looking into family members as possible persons of interest. They had been a close family, and the locals didn't believe either man could be responsible. Following hours of interrogations, both Ad and Andy were cleared and released after investigators could find no evidence linking them back to Nicole's murder. Despite the steadily growing reward being offered for information regarding Nicole's murder, no relevant leads came through. Slowly, the case grew colder, and the number of investigators working on it dwindled. In 2004, Another team of cold case detectives took a crack at the investigation, but once again, none of their leads panned out. Nicole's death remained unsolved, gathering cobwebs as the years went by without any new information. The years passed, and things did not get any easier for the family. Nicole's death particularly affected Andy, who was just five years older and shared a close bond with his stepsister. 
Having lost both Angelica and Nicole in such tragic ways, Andy developed psychological problems. He turned to alcohol and often fought against depression. He'd also been distancing himself from his family since Nicole's murder and eventually relocated to England away from the reminder and the memories of Nicole and the tragedy they suffered. Ad remained in the Netherlands, putting focus into his music career and praying for a miracle that would lead to uncovering the truth behind Nicole's murder. Eventually, though, Ad and Yolanda, too, split up and went their separate ways. Ad moved to Spain, but kept in contact with Andy through phone calls. However, they were emotionally drained after Nicole's untimely demise, and their relationship became strained over time as well. Andy's strange behavior came to a heated end on March 8, 2011. On Facebook, he posted, I will be arrested today for the murder of my sister. I confessed, and I will get in contact soon. In mere moments, his comment was shared over a thousand times. He was immediately arrested by British police and once again made a similar confession while in custody. This confession led to Andy being extradited back to the Netherlands to stand trial for the murder of Nicole. Once back in the Netherlands, Andy was detained in jail and not allowed contact with anyone, including his family. It created a major twist in the case, but the only problem was that there was no evidence apart from the Facebook confession. Police interviewed Ad about his son's confession. Surprisingly, Ad didn't believe Andy was telling the truth. He believed that Andy was just seeking some time in the spotlight after the attention generated by Nicole's case. Yolanda, too, was interviewed following this major twist, but didn't have much to offer in the way of evidence. She said that there had to be an ulterior motive for Andy's vicious crime. Yolanda did not believe that Andy could have done something like this with no apparent reason, but had no idea what the reason could possibly be. But this was only the first shocking statement made by Andy. Soon after he was released due to insufficient evidence, Andy made another damning accusation. He told police that he did not, in fact, kill his sister, but needed to reignite the focus on her case after so many years. That's when he dropped another bombshell. He told police that he'd been keeping a secret that was eating away at him from inside. He knew who killed Nicole. His father, Ad. Andy went on to make serious allegations against Ad, claiming that he'd raped Nicole and she'd become pregnant. In order to cover up his crimes, Ad, Andy claimed, then killed her to keep it a secret. Dumbfounded by Andy's accusations, Ad said he could not believe that Andy would think he was responsible for Nicole's murder. Andy said that he loved Nicole as if she were his own daughter and never wished any harm upon her. These accusations added to the fact that both Ad and Andy were, at one point in the investigation, persons of interest, led authorities to exhume Nicole's body to conduct further DNA testing. On September 9, 2011, Nicole's body was exhumed and sent off to the Netherlands Forensic Institute. The whiplash created by Andy's confessions put added scrutiny on investigators to leave no stone unturned until they got to the bottom of the case. During the examination, three different DNA profiles were compiled from a single trace of sperm. The case was therefore reopened at the end of 2012, with scientists turning to forensic specialists from New Zealand. With the help of the Institute of Environmental Science and Research Facility, ESR, based in Auckland, New Zealand, scientists were able to separate and test the different DNA samples found on Nicole's body. Afterwards, a mathematical and statistical approach was used to determine a true positive match based on which DNA profile appeared more prominently over the other. The three DNA samples were identified as male, and now it was up to Dutch investigators to go back and test the results against those of the suspects, which included Ad and Andy. One of the samples belonged to Nicole's then-boyfriend, who was ruled out due to his solid alibi from previous interviews. The second profile was allegedly unknown, however, in some reports it was said to be Andy's. Police never confirmed those reports. The third profile yielded some interesting results. On January 14, 2014, 46-year-old Joss de G was arrested at his home in Helmand, a city in Eindhoven. Finding his DNA on Nicole could have meant anything, but police were not giving up so easily. After a lengthy interrogation, investigators learned from DG that on the day of Nicole's disappearance, 
he'd had an argument with a girlfriend before storming out of the house. Investigators placed the clues together and believed that Deji may have seen Nicole on her way to work and in that moment of anger unleashed his frustration on the young woman. These may have just been a theory, but Deji did have a history. Deji was previously convicted of three sexually motivated crimes. This first incident involved a 20-year-old woman who was violently raped after Deji grabbed her off her bicycle and took her to a remote area to carry out the crime. This scenario was similar to Nicole's in every way, apart from the stabbing. The second two incidents involved an ex-girlfriend whom he'd sexually abused in her own home. It was also noted that Deji suffered from mental health problems and had been institutionalized and received psychiatric treatment. The discovery of the new suspect meant that Andy had been playing a very dangerous game. After Deji's name was added to the investigation, Andy confessed that the entire Facebook post and accusations leveled against his father were a publicity stunt to reopen the investigation. Since Nicole's death, Andy had been developing a plan and making inquiries about DNA testing and exhumation. He had, over the years, approached police regarding what it would take to get the investigators to exhume and retest the DNA that he believed would be found on Nicole's body. For him, it was time to act as technological advancements had improved since her murder back in 1995. Destroying his own reputation was a risk he was willing to take if it meant justice for his sister, whom he loved so much. Andy knew he had to be convincing enough, given all the red tape behind exhumation policies, and had to give investigators a solid enough reason to retest the evidence. It was a gamble that paid off, and people started to call Andy a hero for taking such a risk. However, the shock of it all was not easily forgotten by his father Ad, and their relationship suffered some strain. But it had got the man they now believed killed their beloved Nicole to trial. The case first went to court in April 2014 and would begin another round of twists as it progressed. Deji's lawyer disputed the DNA evidence, citing other DNA profiles were also gathered during the investigation from Nicole's exhumed body. He insisted that any of the other male profiles could belong to the killer. He further argued that Nicole and Deji could have had a consensual sexual relationship. Nicole had other sexual partners and may have also been pregnant at the time of her death. The prosecution countered the allegations, stating that Nicole had been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Deji, they said, had still been furious from a fight with his girlfriend when he'd come across Nicole. They did concede that there was no motive for killing Nicole other than her being a victim of opportunity in which Deji could unleash all of his pent-up anger. The defense stuck to their claims of the other DNA profiles belonging to the real killer. Deji's trial for the manslaughter and rape charges began in November 2, 2015. The prosecution brought forward two witnesses who claimed Deji confessed to killing the girl. However, Deji's defense team argued that the witnesses had been institutionalized along with Deji at the time, and were just confessing in order to cash in on the 15,000 euro reward that was being offered for more information. The defense further argued that DNA was poorly stored and pushed for samples to be reanalyzed. The court conceded, despite the prosecution arguing it was a delay tactic. The tests were carried out once again by a new forensics team. This delayed the trial to the next year, and in April 2016, the new forensics team presented the results confirming that the most likely suspect was, in fact, Deji. On October 12, 2016, the trial resumed with all the new evidence in place. It was to be a very painful process for the family. The prosecution argued that Deji would be sentenced to 14 years in prison for the manslaughter and rape of Nicole, as the accused Deji could not possibly have had a consensual relationship with Nicole given his background stating that she would not have willingly developed a relationship with them. After much deliberation, and the fact that two DNA tests conducted by separate teams pointed to Deji as the most probable suspect, on October 9, 2018, Deji's acquittal was overturned, and he was sentenced to 12 years for the rape and manslaughter of Nicole. Following the conviction, life mostly returned to normal for the Van den Herk family. Both Andy and Ad were proven innocent through DNA results, allowing them to breathe a sigh of relief. Andy returned to England and tried to live out the rest of his days as normally as he could. In May 2022, though, 
there would be another dramatic end. Neighbors of Andy started to notice his absence and requested a welfare check by police. Upon arrival, police knocked, but with no response, they were forced to break down the door and enter his apartment. Greeted with a foul stench, police ventured into the bedroom and found Andy dead on his bed. Near his body were numerous bottles of alcohol and prescription drugs. It was later determined that Andy committed suicide when toxicology reports proved that the excess amounts of alcohol and drugs caused him to have a heart attack. Investigators determined that, given the stress of Nicole's murder and the subsequent search for justice, Andy could not handle the reality of it all. They believe he eventually succumbed to his depression given his history of mental health struggles. And this marked the end of Andy Vandenherk's tragic yet unusually heroic tale. A man many say loved his sister beyond measure, so much so that he risked his own reputation and freedom to solve the mystery of her murder. Not only did he help solve Nicole's murder, but he also helped investigators remove a dangerous criminal from society. So what did you think of today's case? Would you call Andy a hero? Let us know in the comments below, and if you haven't already, please subscribe for more content. Until next time, stay safe.